Am I on? There we go. All right. We are blessed this morning. Um, you know, Melissa and I, we've been going to this church since 2010. And we've also at times gone to the Palatka Church, um, which is like 45 minutes down the road. And during, you know, COVID time when people weren't out and about, weren't in church, there was probably like four, about well, five to ten people attending church in, in Palatka at the time. And, um, and here, I don't know what it's hovered around, but probably like 60 to 80 or something like that. You know, the Bible tells us in the end times, God will pour out his spirit upon all people. And we're seeing that today. Because this church is full every week now. And Palatka, this last week, had the most people I've, I've seen there since I've been there. I mean, this should be exciting you because at the beginning of what I just quoted, the Bible says, it says, in the end times, God will pour out his people. And in the, in the end times, you know what else happens? Jesus comes. So we need to be excited this morning that we look around and see all these people. And a lot of you are visitors, and I'm not going to have you stand, but if you don't mind raising your hand if you're a visitor... That's a lot of people. From here, that's a lot of people. Melissa and I have friends that have come from Canada that are here this morning, Martin family, all the way from Canada. Um, not just for us, okay, but uh, they're on vacation. But we are blessed, and you should feel blessed this morning to be here in God's house. And, <clears throat> you know, we've been talking about solid ground has been the sermon series. And this is a little bit of a departure. We're kind of like, this is a commercial, in the, you know, uh, because we'll go back to solid ground next week. But the truth is that this is solid ground, what I'm going to be talking about this morning. You can't get any more solid than the Word. And we're going to talk about that. Um, but first, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us all here this morning. What we want you to do this morning is to come into our hearts and minds to keep out all of the outside influence, the things of this world that Satan wants to put in our minds. Please keep that out this morning. Please come into our hearts. Please speak to us. Please help us to become more like you. In your holy name, amen. So words have power. Words have power. George III of Britain passed the Stamp Act of 1765, which imposed the tax on all papers and official documents in the American colonies. Now, you're not in history class this morning, okay? This is still a church, and I'm going to be giving you a sermon. But words have power, and we're going to see that this morning, that George III passes this Stamp Act which didn't make the people of the American colonies very happy. Why? Because we don't like paying taxes. Um, this act caused the colonists to question whether they should be treated like this. So in 1775, now keep in mind, at this time, you still had many people in the colonies that were loyalists. Still many people that wanted to be connected to Britain. And then you had a lot of people, patriots, that didn't want to be, that wanted independence, okay? So in 1775, the people of Virginia were on the fence as to whether they wanted to fight for freedom. So a delegation of Virginia patriots came together at the Second Virginia Convention to vote on how to proceed in the coming conflict. A man by the name of Patrick Henry stood up to speak. Now, we don't have everything that he said. A transcript wasn't kept. Okay, but let's see if words have power. What did he say that we do know he said? Some people know it, right? Because words have power. Give me liberty or give me death. And the rest is history. Because 
The Americans adopted that slogan as a battle cry in 1776, and the truth is that those words were actually heard by the slaves at the time, which inspired them to fight for freedom. So, oh, how much power those words have. Give me liberty or give me death. They had a, these words had a profound and powerful impact on those that heard it and spoke it afterwards. In fact, that probably led to the next words that have power that I want to share with you, which is, I have a dream. Now, I say the words, I have a dream, and you know what I'm talking about. Why do you know what I'm talking about? Because words have power. I have a dream. Who said that? Martin Luther King Jr. said that. And he said so much more in that speech. In fact, Melissa and I watched that on YouTube. There's a clip, obviously. We're in that day and age. Everything's on video now. And it was, at least, thank God, it was in that time, too. And that speech is so powerful and moving. And it had so much in it. But I doubt many of you, if any of you, can tell me and recite that speech word for word. That you may be able to tell me some things that were said. But what we do remember from that speech is what? I have a dream. And again, those words changed this country. Had a complete change in this country. Um, and... And it inspired change among these people, uh, among everyone, really, for the most part. But words, as we know, aren't always used for good. For example, Joseph Stalin is attributed to saying, death is the solution to all problems. No man, no problem. Horrible words. <laughs> but they have power because someone wrote them down. I mean, I'm reading them from up here right? And words also can tell you a lot about the man or woman that speaks them. So there's a woman in 1851 that stood up in a convention and said, began her statement with, aren't I a woman? Does anyone know who said that? Come on, shout it out if you do. Sojourner Truth, someone knows. Sojourner Truth, who was a former slave in New York, and she said these words at a women's convention in Akron, Ohio. She added, I can do as much work as any man. I have plowed, reaped, and husked, chopped and mowed, and can, can any man do more than that? And these words were spoken in 1851. And can you imagine a black woman in 1851 who was illiterate, standing up in a convention filled with white people, in 1851 and speaking on women's rights. It's amazing. <clears throat> so, words have power. Now, in the Bible, what are the first spoken words? Now, I'm not saying what is Genesis 1-1, the first words in the Bible. What is the first spoken word in the Bible. Go ahead. Let there be light. Let there be light. And who spoke these words? God. Jesus spoke these words. Let there be light. John 1, 1, 3 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now, I am not sure why it was God's plan for him to describe himself as the Word in the book of John, as it does here, that Jesus is described as the Word. I'm, I don't know why that is. What, I, I, that's one of the questions I have for Jesus, is why. But... It, I mean, it's there, right? It's in the Bible. I'm not, it's on the screen right now, but it's in your Bible if you turn to John 1. Uh, 1. You'll see it. <clears throat> now, the book of John was not first translated into English, okay? Um, it was, we have it in the Greek in the Bible, okay? So let's see what this word means. The word here in the Greek is logos. Logos. 
Okay, and according to the Greek definition of the term, the word is referred to as, follow me here, this is important, the mind of God, the reasoning of God, and the plan or purpose of God. The mind of God, the reasoning of God, and the plan or purpose of God. So the word being used here is referencing Jesus as, as God's thoughts, plans, and reasoning of God. And we define people by their character, right? We define them by, by their character, which includes their thoughts, their plans, and their reasoning. And this is telling us that Jesus is God as he shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit the same character. He shares with God and the Holy Spirit the same reasoning, the same planning. And this is important because the Bible is full of inspiration from God about his words about his words. And we can learn so much if we take the time to focus on what the Bible has to say about the words of God, the actual words of God. So as we go into this, we start with this understanding. When the Bible talks about the word of God, the Bible is describing the character of God. Okay? The word of God is the character of God. So, we're going to go some, over some of these character attributes this morning, and we're going to start with the first one, which is, let there be. These words were spoken in the very beginning, as we said, let there be. And what does let there be show? It shows that God is creative. You see, God took nothingness, nothingness, a dark void, and he speaks let there be. Now, he could have said anything after let there be. In fact, he could have said, let there be a rainbow colored unicorn. And my daughter Felicity would have been very happy had he done that because she likes rainbows and unicorns, right? And we know that if he had said, let there be rainbow colored unicorn, one would exist because his word has that power. He speaks, and it comes into existence. Now, our words don't have that power. God shared with us the blessing of having a creative mind, but we do not have the power to create as God does. We are able to take the things that God created and be creative with them. For example, before this church that you're sitting in was built, it actually existed, though. It existed where? In the mind of the builder. Because in the mind of the builder, he, saw, he or she saw, saw this building and put it down on paper and blueprints or whatever, and then it was built. But it, was, it first existed in his mind, just like we existed in the mind of God before we were born, before we were created. And so before he created this world, he first pictured this world in his mind, and then he spoke, and it came into existence. And the word he spoke teaches us that God is creative. And while man has done a lot to ruin the beautiful nature that God gave us, there's still plenty of beauty to see. Biologists know how creative God is. Our bodies are amazing creations. Um, so we're going to focus this morning on the eye. By the eye, I mean what's in your head, face right there that allows you to see, your eye. Okay, so I'm going to share with you some facts that I found online. Now I know you, what you're going to say. Can you really call them facts because you found them online? I like to think that these are facts. Okay, yeah, disclaimer. So did you know that one eye consists of more than two million working parts? More than two million working parts. Yeah, like man could ever create that, right? Um, more than two million working parts. Eyes are incredibly complex, highly productive, and resilient organs that can adjust to different conditions and environments immediately because they consist of more than two million working parts. Now, fact two, the muscles that move your eyes are the fastest and strongest muscles in your body. Okay? 
and relative to, the, to their function. Another disclaimer. Um, they're 100 times more powerful than necessary. Now, fact three. Most of us are familiar with fingerprinting, um, yet retina scans are now commonly being used for security purposes. And instead of fingerprinting, um, which has 40 unique characteristics, retina scan or your iris has 256 different unique characteristics. Now, fact number four, your eye can detect over 10 million hue, color hues, unless you're colorblind. <laughs> but 10 million uh, color hues. And the last fact, your eyes are capable of processing 36,000 pieces of information per hour. So it's an amazing thing, your eye, and that's just your eye. <laughs> You've got many other parts that are just as amazing because God pictured them in his mind and created them. I don't consider myself a creative person, and you'd know that if you saw me color or draw a picture. But I have been to art museums, and I've seen large buildings and beautiful architecture, and there are people in this world that are truly blessed with creativity. But what they can picture in their minds pales in comparison to what God can see. And that should not bother you or me. We should just be happy that we are able to and that God shared his creativity with us and he has allowed us to be creative. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing. Words given to the prophets. So we have the Old Testament, which is full of, of uh, prophecies and words from God that were given to the prophets of old. And we know that God is all-knowing because he knows the end from the beginning. We know because all of, the, all of the prophecies that are in the Bible have either come true or will come true. That's a fact. It's a fact. Now, Jesus, is, Jesus his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, they fulfilled over 300 prophecies. Old Testament prophecies. If you were to go into the Old Testament, you could find over 300 that predicts that Jesus will come. Now, a mathematician once calculated the odds of one individual being able to satisfy eight. Okay, now I said there's over 300. Okay, a mathematician did some math and he calculated, well, let's see if just eight, if, if one person could satisfy eight of these prophecies, Eight of these prophecies in just one person, okay? He said the odds were one in ten. No, I'm not done there, because that's nothing, right? One in ten with 27 zeros after it. Now, I'm not a mathematician. In fact, now that I have to help my daughter, Celeste, with math, I really don't like math, because they've changed it completely from what I learned. But I did learn this, okay? I learned that a million has how many zeros? Six. And a billion has nine. And 27 probably doesn't even have a name. Ronald, does it have a name? 27 zeros? Who knows, right? They should name it something. But that's, that's eight. Now, if you do 300, you've probably got two million zeros, okay? I mean, um, that, those prophecies were accurate when they said that Jesus came. And he did. So how do we know that God can predict the future? Well, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, it says, Remember this and show yourselves men. Recall to mind, O you transgressors, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. Amen? Amen. Stay awake on me. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient, ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Declaring the end from the beginning. We should have no doubt that God is all-knowing because he has predicted the future, because his prophecies have come true. And because his prophecies have become true, and because he tells us that he is all-knowing, then we should believe in that and trust in that and have faith in him because of that. Amen? Amen? Okay. Now, 
The Bible tells us that Jesus stood up to speak on the Mount of Beatitudes. And he was surrounded by the multitude, which some speculate was about 5,000 people. And what he said in his Sermon on the Mount has been heard throughout the world since he shared those words. And that is good news. Think about that. He spoke and gave the Sermon on the Mount. And that sermon has been shared throughout this world since then. And we have that, thank God, in our Bible. Thank God that it is in our Bible. Imagine Jesus speaking to all these people and sharing knowledge. Imagine that for a second. He's sharing knowledge with these people that must have been surprised at what, he, what they heard because the truth that they were her, hearing was foreign to them. This understanding, this truth, this pure truth from God, from Jesus, was they'd never heard this kind of thing before. They had heard what the Pharisees were telling them. Okay? If somebody, you know, smacks you, you smack them back. <laughs> they, weren't, they, they didn't hear these words that Jesus was speaking. So, let me ask you this. Um, show of hands, who has seen or heard of a TED Talk? Okay, that's, that's a decent amount of people. Okay, but some people haven't. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the website for TED Talk, so keep in mind they're going to kind of build themselves up here, um, says that TED Talks are when someone speak, shares and speaks and shares a, a great idea in 18 minutes or less. Okay, now their words when they say great idea, okay, um, in 18 minutes or less. Now, um, I've looked through YouTube and it's, I've seen some TED Talks. Um, and I'm confident in saying, because I've seen some TED Talks, that um, great idea is being very generous. Okay, so not all of them are great. Okay, but they do seem to be interesting. Okay, they do seem to be interesting. And they do seem to be popular to some degree. And why they're popular is because people want to hear new and different ideas. They, they like to hear great ideas. Um, and they, they find interest in them. And here we have Jesus sharing, again, pure truth about himself. Because the, the Sermon on the, Mount, uh, on the Mount really is his character that he's sharing with us. And... He's sharing that to the people then, but he also is sharing that to you. Because he knew that, this, that you would hear that, and you would be able to read that. And this Sermon on the Mount, I would, say, I would go as far as calling it the secret of happiness. You know, if somebody ever says, I just I want to be happy in life. You say, okay, go read the Sermon on the Mount, follow that. Follow that. The words that Jesus was sharing on the Sermon on the Mount are pure and they are perfect, just like him. And he was letting his light shine before men. His true character was being described to these people and through the Bible to us. And these words illustrated the stark contrast, the stark contrast between the character of God and sin. And he describes how blessed you are if you are meek and if you are merciful and if you love peace. He explained how the Ten Commandments are more than what they seem. He said that murder is not just an action, but it begins where? In the heart, in the mind, when you choose to hate someone. It starts there. And adultery as well. It doesn't necessarily begin with an action. It begins in your heart and your mind when you choose to lust after someone. He explained how important it is to love your enemies, which again was foreign in Jesus' time. But you know what? It's foreign today, too. It's so much for us as well. He told us not to worry so much, and he gave us a model prayer. And there's so much more pure truth that Jesus gave on the mount, on the sermon, in the sermon. Never in the history of this world, I want you to think about this for a second, never in the history of this world has perfection and purity been described 
as fully and clearly as Jesus did on the Mount of Beatitudes. Did you hear that? Never in history, go back 6,000 years to present, has anyone ever described perfection and purity the way he did. Psalms 12, 6 tells us, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. What does seven times signify? Perfection. It's perfect. His words are perfect. They, do not, they will not fail, and they are pure. Proverbs 30, verse 5 through 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So his words are perfect and they are pure. Now, when you think of the word power, what do you think of? So, when I was writing this sermon... Um, and I was thinking about power, there was something that came to my mind, okay? When I was younger, I would stay at times with my grandmother at her house, okay? And um, she had a TV, but they didn't have 3ABN, or they did and she didn't have it because, you know, we're talking about in the 80s, um, the mid-80s. But what they did have, at least what she had, was TBN. And you may not know what that is, but it's Trinity Broadcasting Network, Okay, so they had TBN and she liked to watch it at times and they had a show, okay, called The Power Team. Okay, now I remember, okay, when I was a kid seeing a commercial or even potentially watching the show to some degree. Now, now this was on a Christian network, right? Because it was, it's, uh, it's supposed to be, um, you know, First Baptist Church, it's supposed to be uh, a Christian-based program. Now you see this and you're like, how? I don't, I mean, I was like five at the time, right? So they were giving sermons, but I wasn't paying attention probably. Um, but what I was paying attention to is this kind of thing, okay? So what they do is they put bricks up there and show their power and strength by breaking bricks or, you know, karate chopping uh, boards and whatever. Just showing their power, right? Real quick, has anybody heard of the power team? Raise your hand if you have. One, two... Three, four, five. Okay, five, six. So, not many people had TBN in the 80s, which I don't, I don't blame you. So, okay. Anyway, so this is what I was thinking at the time. Because when people say power, you know, he's like, oh, power, what do you think of? Oh, somebody being powerful, doing something strong, right? And this is what came to mind for me. <clears throat> now, Jesus exhibited his power in a different way. Okay. He was surrounded by some friends, some of his closest friends, and a bunch of other people around him were mourning. And Jesus looked at the cave in which his friend was laid, and he says these words, Lazarus, come forth. And with those words, Jesus showed his power. You see, they show the unique power that Jesus has, that we do not have. Um, Jesus has the power over death. No one else has that power. No one else has that power but our Lord and Savior. Jesus' power over death gives us proof that what the Bible says about Jesus being all-powerful is true. Because this is the power, this is the ultimate power, the power to bring life from death. And the words, Lazarus, come forth, they prove that point. So you can be 100% positive that your God is all-powerful because he can take you dead in your sins and bring you to life. And give you the life that only he has to give. Because there isn't a doctor on this planet, the most learned person on this planet, that can bring somebody back to life. That's only the power of God. And that's why we know our God is all-powerful. Now, 
the Bible tells us that Jesus is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-present. You've all heard all of these, right? The omnis, omnipotent, omni, omniscient, all the rest of the omnis, right? But what, what you don't really hear often is he's all-loving. He's all-loving. The Bible tells us that God is love. But with a, without an example of what that means, we can be led into all different directions, okay? And people do take that verse into all different directions. I would say that the word love is the most misunderstood, misapplied, and misconstrued word that exists. I, I believe that to be true. You may think something else, but I believe love is quite misunderstood. Each of us have a different picture in our mind when we hear the word love. <clears throat> now, again, that may, be wor that may be true for other words as well. We have a different picture, but love, I believe, can be completely a different thing in another person's... Oh, let me, give you, let me give you an example. So, if I said the word dog, okay you would probably think of one of these things, one, a creature, right? Now, maybe your dog doesn't look like this, or the dog you're thinking about is a different uh, kind or whatever, so you may not exactly think of this, but you're thinking of a dog, I'm sure, right? What you're probably not doing is thinking of one of these, okay? So if I say dog and you think of one of these, I'm sorry, you're wrong, okay? I'm not, and that's not just for me, I'm just saying like if I took a show of hands and said, are these dogs? Probably everybody here is gonna say no. So, so you have a misunderstanding if you believe that one of these are dogs, okay? And this is what I'm talking about with the word love, is someone can think of love and they're thinking of a cat when the word dog is used. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't make sense, but I'm just telling you the truth. So, <clears throat> We live in a society where it seems that up is down and down is up. Children are raised with parents that show them love by mistreating them. Women fall in love with men that either physically harm them or play the field. And so how do we know what true love is without a good example? How, how do we know? Because some children are raised in homes where they don't get to see what love is. So how do they know what love is? How do they know when the Bible says God is love? Ooh, what does that mean to them? We actually have the perfect example. And the words that best illustrate true love are, it is finished. It is finished. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Right before Jesus died, he said these words, it is finished. His work of living a perfect life and then dying for us, that was finished. He completed the task. Now, Jesus could have said three other words. Jesus could have said, I love you. Did you think about that? He could have said, I love you, and then died, right? But again, we don't know what I love you means, really. I mean, it doesn't show, it, it, no, okay, God, he loves me, but it doesn't tell me how much, really. It's just, I love you, right? So he used words that actually showed us how much. It is finished, shows us how much he loves us because of what he did for us, what he completed for us, actually shows us how much? It's so, it's, to me, it's much stronger than I love you. It is finished. So if you find yourself seeking a good example of what love is, maybe your friend would like a good example, or maybe you want to just show someone who doesn't have a good example, point them to the cross. Tell them about Christ and what he did for them and say that, that is what love is. Because there's no greater love than that. There's no greater love than that. Now, the Bible also tells us that the words of God shall never pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35 says, 
heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The character of God will endure. The character of God will endure. Everything else that you see around you will melt like wax, but the character of God will endure. So if you want to live forever, if you want to have eternal life, you must, must take on his character. Because if you don't, it is the only thing that will not pass away, his character. Everything else will. You have to have his character, because if you don't, heaven and earth is everything else. And it will pass away. You can choose to be a part of this world and take on the character of this world. However, you will pass away just like this world. Or you can choose to, choose to invite Jesus into your life and to let him change you to be like him. And then you will have eternal life with him in heaven. It's as simple as that. A little girl was walking through the hallway of her home and she came to the place where there was a cellar door. And it was one of those trap doors on hinges and it was open. And she looked down into the darkness, heard a noise down there and said, who's down there? And her daddy said, it's me, daddy. She replied, well, I wanna come up there, I wanna come down there to be with you. And he answered, well, I've already taken the ladder away, but if you'll just jump, I'll catch you. Now, this was a little girl, and she thought, jumping down into a dark hole? You see, she could hear her daddy's voice, and she, but she couldn't see him or feel him. And she said, but daddy, I can't see you. Now, honey, wait a minute. I want to ask you a question. Do you believe I'm down here? Sure, I believe you're down there. I'm talking to you. Do you believe I'm strong enough to catch you? I believe you're strong enough to catch me. Okay, he said, do you believe that I love you? Yes, Daddy, I believe you love me. He asked, have I ever told you a lie? No, you've never told me a lie. Okay, you know I'm here and I love you and I would never lie to you. Now jump to me. It's up to the little girl whether she trusts her father's words, his voice. Do we trust God? You know, we don't see him, but we hear him. And we know his character, and he's never lied to us. And he tells us to jump. Are we going to jump? The words of the Lord show us his true character. Today, we have seen some good examples, like God is creative, he's all-knowing, he's perfect, he's pure, he's all-powerful, and he loves us more than we can comprehend. And there's so much more than that about him that he wants us to know. And we live in a world where there is a lot of confusion about the character of God. And there's a saying, there's a saying, I'll take your word for it, right? I'll take your word for it. It means you don't need any more proof, okay? The person that's talking to you, you trust them. And when they say, say something, you just say, I'll take your word for it. Why don't we take God's word for it? His word is perfect and pure to everything. Why don't we take his word for it? Step out in faith and take him by, allow him to take us by the hand and take on his character. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing 286, Wonderful Words of Life.